So I want to tell you about research that I'm doing recently. So I'm working on understanding bird beaks, how they're shaped. So these guys are called Darwin's finches, these birds. They are linked to how evolution started. When Darwin was traveling around the world in his trip, he was collecting animals and looking at all the diversity of animals. And one of the birds that he found, or one of the species, are these Darwin finches. They are related group of species. These birds look... Uh, uh, they, they have differences in shape, but they're sort of closely related. They have similar color of feathers, but their sizes and their beaks are different. And what's cool about that is that eventually they figured, it, figured out that all of these are related species and that maybe a million or two years ago, one species, one, one bird, flew to an island, the Galapagos Islands, and settled there. And from there you got the diversity of 14 different species living on those islands right now. And those species diverged very fast, relatively. It's like millions of years, but relatively you got a lot of diversity emerging very quickly. And what's cool about that is that not every bird that settled the island actually diverged so much into that. There are some birds that just flew and uh, maybe flew in before the Darwin finches, but they have, but there are less species of those. So there are species that are more evolvable, more adaptable than other species. And that might happen because they, there's a lot of variation in uh, the population. So you might think if you have a population where there's a lot of variation in height, and all of a sudden this population goes into a region where they need to start climbing higher or they need to reach higher like a giraffe for example or whatever in, in order for them to reach higher the population where there's a lot of evolvability or a, a lot of variation within the population then there is there is always like a bunch of people who or a bunch of the individuals who are lot much uh, much taller than average and those are the ones that are going to survive more and so, if you want to actually read more about what happens in Darwin Fishes, this is a really cool book. It's a popular book. This other book by Peter Grant. This guy, this is an academic book, and this is a guy in Princeton who, with his wife, Peter and Rosemary Grant, they studied how these birds are actually, because they're so adaptable and evolvable, they're actually, you can actually see evolution in those birds in real time. You can see the evolution in their beaks. So some of those birds they're, they live on the ground and they pick up seeds from the ground. They're called the ground finches. There's three types of them, the small, medium, and large. The large one eats the bigger seeds. So it has to have a bigger beak and it has to be shaped in a way that makes it stronger and able to crack the seeds. So only this largest, the largest birds can eat the largest seeds. There's the intermediate one that eats like a little bit of the largest and a little bit of the smallest. And then there's the small ground finch that eats only small, soft seeds, right? So the largest one needs a lot of food, but it can crack uh, more nuts. The smaller ones need less food, but they can crack less nuts. And what happens here, they actually observed that when the birds, well, they observed that when a drought happens, like an extreme drought where all the green went away and all the seeds were being eaten and all the easy seeds, like the small soft ones, were gone, there were only hard seeds left. And so only the individuals that can crack these hard seeds were remaining. And they actually saw that the population, after like maybe 80% of the population in the medium ground finches died, and when you look at which one survived, which one didn't survive, you see that actually most of the females did not survive because they're smaller, and only the individuals that have bigger beaks and bigger size were actually surviving. So you can actually see evolution in real time. And so my research comes in in trying to understand uh, into, into applying mathematical methods to understand the shape differences. So if I give you like a shape of a nose and another nose, you can tell that they're different by looking at them, but you can't quantify like how is this one different from this one. So you need to sort of invent mathematical measures and techniques to take a shape and compare it to another shape. Right? So I want something to tell me that I have, let's say, this shape, that shape, maybe that shape. One thing you can do is like you can take like if this was the head for example, you can, I can measure the length of the beak, I can measure like the width of it, I can do this for that one and that one. 
But there are also other measures. I can look at the curvature. How curved is this peak? How curved is it in the third direction? How curved is it in this direction? Uh, you could also look at uh, different kind of measures. If you can say, I have two beaks. Let me do this one in white. I have two beaks, this one and this one, and I have a third beak, which is between them, like this one. Uh, like, in size, it's intermediate, right? So, I want to construct something that gives me how much this, this one is different from that one, and I want to put them on a scale. So, maybe this one is over here, this one is over here, and the mathematical measure that you give me, it could be like how much this curvature is different than how much that curvature. So you somehow have to invent the measure, but we wanted to say that if there's something in between, we want it to also come out in between. So we want to sort of invent uh, a scale in which you can compare shapes. And I actually found something cool in that if I take these beaks, some of them are like oriented this way, some of them are oriented that way, like compared to the face. Like some of them are like thicker, whatever. And the thicker ones, like the deeper ones, the, these are called deeper ones if they're like along the face. If Like this is deep, this is uh, short. So the length is this direction, the width is that direction. So I have that. And what I found is that you can, I can actually fit this form with a parabola. So the beaks of these finches have simple forms, they're like parabolas. And I can just take these and align each one along the long axis. So if it's pointed that way, I can just orient it that way. And then I found that if you look in the third dimension, it's a parabola. If you look in that dimension, it's a parabola. But the cool part is that as you go to the tip, naturally, the curvature is getting higher and higher as you go towards the tip. And so I can take the, these things, like the curvature in this direction, that direction, and how fast the curvature is getting sharper towards the tip. So I have these three numbers. And then I do that for like 50 samples, like for all the species. And so in this three-dimensional space, now instead of like a single scale, one dimension, I have a three-dimensional scale. Like the first curvature, like I'm just going to call it uh, K1, K2, and K3. These are the three numbers that I got from here. And then each bird, each species, each sample, I, I actually have like a 3D scan of the skull of the birds, will come out on one point in this space. Right? I also found that, which is not expected, that all the birds lie on a plane. So they're all, the samples are like this on a plane which I don't understand why yet, but somehow they all have this relationship. And the cool thing, the, the reason why you want to understand these kinds of things, this gives me a clue to how the bird is growing. So I want to understand also something, not just about evolution and the relationship between different species, I want to understand something about development. So this, is, this would be called like evo divo, evolution, like how uh, species evolve and how they're related to each other, like how the form of one bird starts to evolve into a different species and it'll have a different beak. There's also divo, which is development, which is uh, how like you start as a single cell and you grow into a larger organism. So I'm uh, taking what I learned about the shape analysis, which would be called morphometry, the science of measuring shape, and then I'm taking that, and I want to understand how, like in an embryo, let's say this is like where the face is, somehow like you get an initial mass of cells, and these cells start to grow, like they start to divide, so each one starts to divide here, 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 here. And as you go, like, not all of them divide because the beak is getting smaller and smaller, so a fraction of those will go into the next stage, and then the next stage, and then the next stage. So I want to know what is the pattern in this, of this division, how the cells know where to, in what direction to divide. This cell can do, go that way, can go that way, can go straight. So how does the cell know in what direction to divide? That's also, it needs to get chemical cues from its surrounding and figure out where it is in space. So even cells have to solve this problem. If you watch one of my earlier videos on classical physics, I talked about Mach's principle. 
And, and there you, you were talking about the relativity of space, like you have to measure yourself relative to other things. Even cells have to solve this problem. They have to figure out where they are relative to other cells. And one thing they do is they emit chemicals called morphogens. Like they emit, each, each one emits different kinds of chemicals. And by sensing like the concentration and it's like saying it's, the concentration is more in that direction than that direction. And so you know that maybe I should divide in this direction, in that plane. So they need to figure out that. So that's one thing we're trying to figure out. Also, like I can look at it in a different way. I can say, here's an initial cell. And then I can look at its lineage trajectory. So it divides into that, divides into that, divides into that, until it gets to the tip. So I go there. So this is a trajectory, a lineage of all the daughters of that cell. And then, and there's only one line on average because the number is decreasing. So actually not every cell will divide. Some cells will divide, 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 and then stop because not all of them will go to the tip because it's getting smaller. So you, you have things like that. I mean, this one stops here. Okay, so I'm trying to figure that out and then this is related to, uh, I'm going to take what I found about the, in the information measures and figure it out in this case. So that would be called morpho evodivo. So that, this is what I'm trying, this is what I'm trying to call the paper. Morpho is because I'm using like the science of studying shape. Morpho means, it's like maybe a Greek letter, a Greek word for shape evolution develop and uh, development. So I'm really, I'm trying to understand how the shape is related to evolution and related to de development and how development affects evolution. Because the differences in beaks, like how do I get a bigger beak, would be like maybe some of these um, genes and proteins and morphogens that go and tell the cells when to divide. Some of these genes, like they need to be modified a little bit so that they start to proliferate more and make a bigger beak, right? So uh, you need to control when does the division stop in order to control the size. For example, if, I, if you want to grow an individual like twice the length, all the gene has to do is you, need, you can do the same developmental mechanism. You don't have to like design everything from scratch. You can just do tweaks on the developmental me mechanism. You say like, okay, this stage, just let it last a little bit longer and you'll get a bigger beak or you get a longer beak or wider beak. So you want to understand how changes in these genes affect the development of the organism and how that development constrains, like limits the number of possibilities that you can get for evolution. Because if the beak evolves in a specific way, it's hard to just remove that from scratch and start from scratch and design a completely different thing. You, you tweak it. And so this tweaking affects the possibilities of what kind of birds you can get. And because there's, a lot, there's some sort of flexibility in these Darwin finishes, that's why there's a lot of them and they can evolve faster. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Hope you got something out of it and see you next time.